Nate Talks to You on Twitter recently made a tweet that contained a clip from a Charlie Kirk interview with Tucker Carlson. Nate had his own take on this, but I wanted to get a larger clip from it and give my own take on it. So here we go. You and the point is that it's less theological in the sense, I mean, I have a very specific theological view of the historical Jesus, but do you at least believe in the concept that there's something bigger than you? Well, of course, of course. Do you? Right. I'd say that most people in general, even atheists, believe that there either is or could be something larger than us. I mean, just about everyone believes in the universe. That doesn't mean they believe there's a supernatural element to it. The question is whether or not that thing that's larger than us is even aware of us. And to have this notion that, oh, this, this, this supreme being is, is aware of everything that we're doing and, they, and he judges what we do and judges what we think about. Yeah, that's kind of, that's, that's not very rational or logical to believe that. I mean, you can believe it, fine, but... Uh, you can't claim that, uh, oh, well, if you don't believe that, then you you just hate God. You know, that that sort of argument. I mean, I'm not saying you're you're making that argument, but I've seen a number of people make that kind of argument when this sort of logic is brought to their attention. And to those that make that kind of argument, I just say it's hard to hate something you don't believe in in the first place. Do you think you're omnipotent? Which would be fine, by the way, if you were, but... <laughs> But we're not, actually. And, um, you know, as my father always said to me when I was a child, the root, and he used a word I'm not going to repeat, it was a bad word, but it was an evocative word. But he always said the root of all wisdom is knowing, you know, what a flawed person you are, effectively. If there ever was a good thing to come out of a religious belief, it would be that. The notion that we are flawed people and that we need to look at our flaws. You know, and, and seeing yourself realistically, which is... You know, someone who can't see beyond like the next 20 minutes, if that person whose judgment is often clouded by s desires and silly things uh, like that. And well, I certainly wouldn't make blanket judgments about our desires as being silly things. I mean, some desires can be silly, but I wouldn't judge all of them as silly. I wouldn't judge all of them as negative. Basically, a, a person who's imperfect, once you understand that and really internalize it, um, you're, you're in a better place to make good decisions. I understand the purpose in looking at ourselves as being imperfect, but that assumes that there's even such a concept as something being perfect in, in, in general. I mean, you say, oh, well, only God is perfect. Yeah I, yeah, I guess, but I mean, if you look at some of the decisions he's made, if you read the Bible, it doesn't look like he's perfect either, that he's made some mistakes too. Oh, but don't judge God that, yeah, whatever. You know, my, my issue with this element of looking at us as always oh, being imperfect is, is, I mean, the only way that we could make decisions that would truly have the least bad ramifications to them is if we knew the future. I just don't think it's good to look at our our decisions in, in such as being perfect versus imperfect you know we're human but maybe that's some of the point of what they're trying to make too and, and i'm just kind of misinterpreting it or or whatever right so you can't communicate truth literally it has to be metaphorical why well, what's the argument because we've reached the limits of language what's up, baby? the 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 reality the Logos reaches a place. Yes, the, the reality of life, the spiritual reality, even the physical reality, um, is beyond the limit of language to describe. We actually, we don't have the words. So it's beyond, not to, beyond reason, but it's, I guess that would be... It is beyond reason. Yeah. It's beyond reason, it's beyond physics. Isn't that quite an assumption to make? Doesn't that make you automatically biased against anything that actually does prove something? Nothing that we have created can capture the essence of what's true, not the essence of what's true. We, we can measure certain things, certainly in the short term, math is super helpful if you wanna know what something weighs or how long it is. Math can prove a whole lot more than that. But math is incapable of answering questions like what happens when you die, what's the most important thing? Like AI will never get to that, okay, ever. 
Well, I mean, it might eventually come to some conclusions that you don't like. And so, in place of literal descriptions and in place of math, we seek metaphor and poetry and, you know, indistinct, imprecise expressions of this thing or this reality that we all sense but can't, again, quite sum up in words or numbers. Well, it's true that we do seem to seek childlike descriptions of complex subjects. Almost every culture or civilization had their own way of doing that. I mean, yes, civilizations have always wanted to explain the unexplainable. That doesn't mean that they all come up with religions. That doesn't mean they all come up with this idea, oh, there's a higher power judging and watching everything that we do. No, they, we don't all come to those conclusions. There are plenty of countries that are not religious at all. Or communicating it. And now we're ruled by a group of people that think 84% of the religious people on the planet are wrong. Wrong about what? I mean, it's pretty important what they say you're wrong about. <laughs> it's pretty funny. They they don't have the balls to say that, of course. <laughs> but but if that's, you, that's exactly. But what if it you is. look at it across the scope of like known history, it's like how many civilizations at scale, big civilizations, have been secular in that we know of ever? Is that a serious question? And by secular, I mean don't acknowledge in kind of ordinary, everyday of conversation. Sure. Yeah, exactly. The existence of something bigger and more powerful than our temporal leadership. And you would say well, none. I don't know, Vietnam, China? Like, this is the first one. This actually is an experiment that we're conducting without even knowing it, I think, in secular society at that's, scale. That's so profound. And... <laughs> no, no, it isn't profound. So, like, how's it going? And I would say not that well. And I'm not saying that as a Christian. I'm just saying that as, like, an observer of how well things are going. Not that well. And why would it go well? Like, people are born knowing there's something more powerful than us, uh, at that point, when someone is born, everything is more powerful than they are. Come on, man. I, I'm a Christian. I don't think it necessarily points to Jesus. It hasn't over time pointed to Jesus for a lot of people. They may be wrong or right or whatever, but every person is born knowing, obviously, that people are not kind of the final word on everything. I mean, we're we're born with an intuitive moral sense, a sense of justice— Lord of the Flies was written for a reason. This is right, that is wrong, a lie is bad. That's not something we're taught, it's something that we know. Why do we know that? Because it pre-exists us, that's why. I mean, sure, kids know that a lie is bad, sure. But that's not the same thing as, as having this, this massive knowledge about morality. I mean, kids will pull the wings off of insects. Kids will torture animals if they're not told first, hey, no, don't do that. You know, now there are some kids who will, will do it anyway after they know it's bad, sure. But some kids just don't have that sense. They need to be told. And to not acknowledge that um, is a recipe for for disaster, the disaster we're living through. Look, you, you need to acknowledge the inherent mystery in life. You need to say out loud, as we just had lunch, and at lunch you kept using this phrase, the spoken truth, which I thought was such a cool, and maybe a common Christian phrase. I've never lived in a Christian world, so I don't really know, but I love that phrase. It stuck with me. Thank you. Because it's not enough to know the truth. The act of speaking it, articulating yes. it, putting it into language makes it real. Almost sounds like a Disney sort of concept. Oh, if you dream it hard enough, you can speak it into existence. Yeah, it, it is a Christian phrase, because in the book of John, the first you know, verse is, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, yes. and the Word became flesh. But that Word is Logos, right? So in, they're saying Jesus is the Logos, which is Jesus was the spoken truth. Interesting. The spoken truth. Yes, the spoken truth. Ah, so it seems that even Tucker was pessimistic of that sort of phrasing. That, because, to not to go too deep into Christian theology— They didn't teach us in Episcopal school, I'm just here to tell you. I'm not shocked. <laughs> You know, usually when Tucker laughs, it's not because he's actually amused. But in the creation story of Genesis, we're, we're told we're made in the image of God. God speaks things into existence, spoken truth, right? So God didn't make it into existence. He spoke it into existence. And God said there would be light. And God said there would be distinction. And God said that there would be... Yes. ...said, spoken truth. Well, I love that. And, and I think one of the truths that we need to speak is that we don't know. 
But you're not expanding that to the notion that God might not exist. That the mystery of life isn't just this ancillary thing. Like, there's some things we don't understand, but we will. No, the mystery of Mm. life is life. It's central to life. It is the core of life, is unknowable by people. Right now, we don't have the means to explain most of it. We may have a better way of explaining a lot of this in the future. Not everything, but, you know, 42. What is this? How did we get here? Where are we going? These are not questions we will ever answer with scientific certainty in this life. Within our lifetimes? Yours and mine? Yeah, probably not. And, like, I think we need to start there. Because if we don't start there, then you have this procession of charlatans who come forth, they're like, no, 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 we got it under control. This, here's what it's about. Here's where we're going. It's like, you don't know that. We can analyze how we've done things in the past. We can analyze occurrences that have happened in the past and how they relate to the present time. We can build models to try to predict the future. Yeah. Like, I call BS on you. You don't know that. I mean, I spent my whole life, like, I actually don't have very many answers, but I'm, I think my one skill is, like, I can tell deception from, like, 100 yards for some reason. It's like, it's a smell thing. Well, of course you're good at that. It takes one to know one, right? And I see these people come up. It's like almost 100% of them are lying. Well, here's what we know. There's a whole lot of things we can say that we know with reasonable certainty. Now, if you're saying, do you know 100%? Well, no. I mean, we can hardly say that about anything. (laughs) Oh, really? Do we know that? How how, How do we know that? And the answer is, of course, but they don't know it. And that's fine. Most scientists do not claim to know things that they don't know. I'm totally comfortable with people saying, you know, I don't really know. And, and that, that's how we ended our lunch, where you said, you know, do you see a realignment? I'll just, I, I have no idea. Yeah. Well, that's a liberating thing to it's admit. It's super comforting, It's a though. liberating thing to admit. And that's, I must say, my tolerance for atheism uh, has, has really dwindled to nothing at this point. I suppose it depends on his understanding of what atheism even means. If he thinks that atheism means the absolute belief that there is not a God, then uh, then maybe that makes sense. Maybe his response to that makes sense. But if it's just the belief that, hey, yeah, there's not enough proof of God for me to have this belief, yeah, how can you... Yeah, that's weird. And, and my, my tolerance for people who are agnostic or aren't really sure. I or totally seeking, agree with this. Yes. But the idea that there are people who are completely certain, as a matter of religious faith, that there's no God, I just find it hilarious and like so childish. It's, I just can't take it seriously. That's nice. But most atheists that I've ever talked to, in fact, I haven't really ever met someone who who believes that uh, there absolutely is no God. Period. Yeah, I've never met anyone like that. I'm sure they exist, but most atheists simply lack a belief in God because there isn't enough proof for them. So, I don't know. Whatever. Have a nice day.